And this anthem nails it. So enjoy as we sing to the glory of God. Thank you, choir. Um, we're going to have a second musical offering in a couple of weeks as our praise team gets uh, rolling again on the 31st of October. Scott and the gang will be here leading us uh, in the singing that day. Thank you, George. Comes from Mark 10, verses 35 through 45. You can follow along in the Pew Bibles on page 1571 or on the screens. Then James and John and the sons of Zebedee came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. 
What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? But to sit at the right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the gentles, Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So be the word of God. You know, I think about all these keys. And sometimes I think that when we live in the world, we get confused because the world tells us so many things. I think many of the problems that we see in the world today and the majority of the conflicts in the past come as a result of all these options and this sense of pride that we have over knowing which key goes where. You know, it was interesting because I thought at one point when I saw these keys, I said, I know what key opens that door. <laughs> and I went right down there. I was going to show Ray how smart I was. Didn't work. Sometimes that's how we look, a little foolish in the eyes of God when we try to take something that we think we know is going to work and it doesn't. You so, see, I think that pride is the greatest sin because it leads to every other sin. All are equal, all are condemned by God, but pride is the one that often opens the doors to every other thing that we do. After all, that's what led Lucifer, the devil, to revolt against God. We read in Ezekiel 28, as God speaks to the devil, your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. And he was cast out of heaven and doomed to live forever outside the glory of God and heaven itself. And pride is what led Adam and Eve to disobey God and eat the fruit. The devil, when coming to them, said in so many words, it's so beautiful. God must be wrong. You're smart. You can see that. It's like me with a key trying to open that door. Yeah, that's right. I'm smart. I can do it. Go ahead and eat. They say pride comes before the fall, and it's true. Nothing good ever comes out of a prideful or arrogant person. And we always need to beware of its subtle lure in our life. No one is exempt from it, even those who walk with Jesus. Yet Jesus can take even the messiest situation and turn it around. In Nikos Kansaki, I, I know, can't say this name, but uh, Kazansaki's novel, and if you know how to pronounce that, you can tell me after church. Uh, I won't take it as a prideful act. I'll just say that you know his name. But Nikos, he wrote a novel called Christ Recrucified. And there is a scene in which four village men confess their sins to one another in the presence of a clergyman making their confession. And one of the men, Michalis, cries out, how can God let us live on the earth? Why doesn't he kill us to purify his creation? And the religious leader answers, because, Michalis, God is a potter and he works in the mud. 
And sometimes when I think about my life, and maybe as you think about your life, it seems like we're living in the mud, we're trying to make our way, and it seems like we just go deeper and deeper. Now, you would think that the disciples would know this better than anyone, and yet they were still being molded and shaped by Christ. And we see that in our text today. Jesus is having a candid conversation with them, and he tells them that he's going to suffer and die. Things are going to change, and they'll need to be strong to carry on. Now, these men had walked for Jesus for almost three years. You'd think that something of his character would have rubbed off on them. Yet Jesus continually modeled humility. The problem is, is that the disciples were knee-deep in the world. Success to them was claiming a position. It was being in charge and leading others. It was having the authority to direct the mission. And when Jesus mentions his death, it gets them all thinking about the future. And instead of asking, what will this mean? They quickly asked, who will take his place? In other words, which of us is best equipped to carry on the mission and lead the team? That's where pride got James and John. They were part of Jesus' inner circle. And so naturally they would think that, well, Peter's probably going to try to take over, but we know he always steps in it. So we're the ones. Lord, Lord, make us the ones. The world defines success in many ways. I like the story told about the football coach and his top aide. And they were getting ready for the season, and the aide was there, and he was the one who was doing all the recruiting. And he said, what are you looking for, coach, in this year's team? And the coach says, well, you know that player who gets knocked down and doesn't get up? And the recruiter says, yeah, you don't want any of them. Right. And he says, you know that player who gets knocked down and gets up and then gets knocked down again? And he says, yeah, yeah, you don't want any of them. You want the tough guys, right? You want the leaders. You want the powerful. He says, wait a minute. He says, you know the guy who gets knocked down, gets up, knocked down, gets up, knocked down, gets up again? And he says, that's who you want, right? And he says, no, I want the guy who's knocking them all down. You see, that's what we think about success, the guy who bowls over everyone else and takes charge. That's what most people think of when they think about success. It's about the one that's left standing. When we were kids, we used to go out to the lake and there was a raft out there. We'd play king of the raft or king of the hill. And we'd be knocking everybody off and we'd see who could stand up and stay up the longest. The problem is, is that God has a very different definition of success. As Jesus finishes telling them about his pending death, the disciples go into panic mode. They all believe that Jesus was about to set up his earthly kingdom, and of course, as the king, he would appoint people to serve as officials. They already had it in their mind what was going to happen. Jesus the king, and then the twelve as the court. They all presume that that important task would fall to them simply because of their connection to Jesus. But without him there, someone would have to take over and be the lead. Well, James and John go to Jesus and and try to find out his succession plan. Even more, they suggest one, just in case he hadn't thought about it. Put us in charge when you go. After all, we've been with you as long as anyone, they say. And the text says that when the others heard about it, and I love it, isn't this just like real life? When the others heard about it, they were indignant. Who do they think they are going to Jesus with that suggestion? Well, I want to tell you why they were indignant, if they're like you and me. First, they were annoyed that James and John thought about it before they did. (laughs) If they had thought about it, they would have gone to, to Jesus and said, how about me? Peter especially, right? Peter, well, Lord, you know I'm your number one man. I suppose when you're gone, somebody's going to have to take over, and I'm just wondering, who are you thinking about? (laughs) Or maybe Nathaniel, he's the one with no guile, right? Or maybe it was Simon the Zealot. He had that spirit to take over and take charge. 
Yeah, they all probably thought about it. But second, they probably felt they had as much right to sit at the right or left as James and John. They all believed that they had the right to the position of power and influence, maybe even more than all the others. Now, this kind of mindset is fairly normal for most folks. Let's admit it, we get upset if someone gets the promotion we thought we deserved at work, right? Or when they hire someone from the outside and pass us over, we get mad. We've been there, we've been faithful, we've been true. It's all about what we deserve. We earned it. And the disciples were just thinking like all of us tend to think in a situation like that. And that's when we see Jesus telling them that if you want to be first, you have to be a servant to all. He says that is God's way. And we kind of get it, right? I like the story told about uh, breakfast in one household. You've probably heard this story. The mother was preparing pancakes for her two young sons, Kyle and Ryan, and they began to argue over who would get the first pancake when it came out of the pan. Not wanting to miss the teachable moment, the mom said, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. Isn't that great? Yeah. Maybe you've tried that before in your household. Well, Kyle turned to his younger brother and said, okay, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> There's always an angle, isn't there? We want someone else to be the one who is serving, the other one else who is giving, the other one to be the person to do what we don't want to do. And that's not exactly what this mom had in mind. But you see, true greatness can only be found in humility. Because in humility, we're saying to the world that we're trusting God. It's pointing to heaven above and showing them that true authority comes in Him alone and that we are here to serve God. That's why sometimes, you know, I, I think God cringes as we act out in the church and not that we're not acting out for righteous and good causes, but sometimes we go about it in the right way as bullies, where it's humility and love that will make all the difference. Paul captures this in his letter to the Philippians. He tells the church, that's you and me, the body of Christ, to imitate Christ's humility. In verse 5, he says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And then he explains how Jesus did it. Paul says, Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. You might say that the way up in God's kingdom is the way down. True greatness in life is not found in the accumulation of medals or trophies, but in a life that is emptied out into the person of God and the service of others. I read of one seminary where, as the pastors were graduating, not only did they get their cap and, and, and gown and their, their collar, but they also were given a towel. And they, they were told to carry that towel with them wherever they went to remind them that no matter what the size of the church they were serving became or what titles they accumulated over the years, that their primary purpose in the ministry was to serve as Jesus served. In Mark 10, 45, it says, Jesus tells us the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus modeled what he would have all of us do as we live out our calling in the world. As Christians, we're called to be followers of Christ, and like him, we're called to serve others, not step over them, not claim our rights and privileges, not to do whatever we can be to be successful or to get that promotion. If you want to strive to be the best husband, the best father, the best wife or mother, then serve others, the people you love, the people you work with. You know, I'm kind of embarrassed because I've been a part of the Watch Hill Fire Department for three years. And 
each of those three years, I received an award. <laughs> now, we don't have a big department, but the last two years, I was named the member of the year. That's pretty impressive, right? And I said to someone, I said, I, I, I don't deserve that. There's a lot of people who have so much more knowledge, who have been here so long, who have given so much. And the person said to me, no, you deserve it. You deserve it because you're always here for us. I wanted to cry when I heard that because I never thought about my service in the fire department that way. And yet all of us are called to serve in some place, in some way. And when we serve like Christ, people notice. They also notice when we try to bully them. And if there was one way that I'd want to be remembered or known, it would be to be like Christ. Here's something to think about as I close. A, a recent poll asked teenagers to identify the person they admired most as a role model. Now, they said you couldn't name your mom or dad. And the truth is, even if the teenagers give you a hard time, they look up to you as moms and dads. But you couldn't name them, but here's the list of the top role models for teenagers. 37% answered that their top role model was a relative, someone in the family who they watched and wanted to be like. 11% pointed to a teacher or a coach, someone who worked with them and tried to bring the best out of them. Another 9% said it was a friend. 6% said a religious leader. Another 6% said maybe it was an actor or a musician, somebody famous. 5% listed an athlete. 4% a political figure. Boy, that number's really high. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> On the national stage or whatever, you know. Hey, and 4% also mentioned a high-profile faith leader. But you see, the high numbers were in the men and women who lived out their lives in their circle, who had given them an example whether it be a relative or a coach or a teacher, on how to live and how to share and how to serve. This survey shows what I think many of us believe to be true, that, that there are big personalities that we admire. But the truth is, it's the people that we know and have seen making a difference that are the great ones. The people we lift up as great are the ones who visit us when we're sick, perhaps bringing warm chicken soup. It's the people who hold our hands and pray with us when we're facing trials, who encourage us when we're struggling with the issues of life. Greatness in our personal lives is not measured by the world standards. It's measured by who is walking with us and serving with us. You see, they get it. Jesus turned the world upside down in the face of Jesus' proclamation. We have to surrender all our ingrained ideas of honor and dishonor, power and weakness. Jesus said, you know the ones who are considered the rulers by the Gentiles. They show their authority, but that's not the way that we are to do it. One of my favorite hymns focuses on service, and we're going to close with that. It's entitled, I Am Thine, O Lord. It was written by Fanny Crosby. You know, on Wednesday night, uh, Nancy Ballantyne is sharing with us some of the stories and histories between, but behind the hymn writers and, the, and the, the lyricist. And Fanny Crosby was blind, and she, yet she wrote hundreds of hymns, and some of them are some of our favorites, like this one. The second verse of the hymn records these words. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. You see, that's what Jesus was calling us all to do. And in doing that, we will have the, the key to success and greatness. Here's what the world says. I got the key for you. Don't get lost in that. Find your key to success and greatness in serving and in humility in Christ. Amen. Let's close our service now by singing Draw Me Nearer, verses 1 and 4.